Long before the French Revolution, scientists were not sure how to quantify motion. Equations that explained how objects moved and collided were in their infancy. A crucial contribution to this subject would come from an unusual source. Meet the aristocratic 16-year-old daughter of one of King Louis XIV's courtiers, Emily du Châtelet. Emily du Châtelet would have a huge effect on physics in her tragically short lifetime. Unheard of for a woman in the 18th century, she would publish many scientific works, including a translation of Sir Isaac Newton's Principia, the greatest treatise on motion ever written. Du Châtelet's translation is still the standard text in France today. Musa mihi causas memora. Use my memory code. Oh, muse, the causes and the crimes relate. <laughs> what goddess was provoked and whence her hate? For what offense the queen of heaven began to persecute so brave, so just a man? Do not be cross with your sister, because she persecutes many a just man. Only the other night, Emily silenced the Duke de Luynes when she divided a ridiculously long number in her head in a matter of seconds. You should have seen the incredulity on their faces when they realized Emily was correct. Oh. It was it uh, my sister's astounding intelligence or her boundless beauty that made their mouths gape, I wonder. Oh, well, yes, you, you have a point, monsieur. <laughs> monsieur, I thank you for your kindness. I fear, however, that my wit is only a curiosity to others. If only my mind were permitted opportunity. <laughs> my dearest Emily, you are blessed with intellect and courage. Use them both and the world will fall at your feet. No. In one sense, she is a woman utterly out of her true time and place. She's a philosopher, a scientist, a mathematician, a linguist. She demands a freedom that women didn't begin to enjoy until over 150 years later. A freedom to study science, to write about it, and to be published. Du Châtelet married a general in the French army at age 19 and had three children. She ran a busy household, all the while pursuing her passion for science. She was 23 when she discovered advanced mathematics. She enthusiastically took lessons from one of the greatest mathematicians of the day, Pierre de Maupertuis. He was an expert on Newton, and she was his eager young student. It seems they had a brief affair, but then he set off on a polar expedition. Du Châtelet then fell passionately in love with Voltaire, France's greatest poet. A fierce critic of the king and the Catholic Church, Voltaire had been in prison twice and exiled to England, where he became enthralled by the ideas of Newton. Back in France, it wasn't long before he again insulted the king. Du Châtelet hid him in her country home. The poor little creature is devoted to him. Isolated far from Paris, Du Châtelet and Voltaire turned her chateau into a palace of learning and culture complete with its own tiny theater. Many of the great philosophers, poets, and scientists of the day visited. Du Châtelet learned from the brilliant men around her, but she quickly developed ideas of her own. Much to the horror of her mentors, she even dared to suspect that there was an error in the great Sir Isaac Newton's thinking. Newton stated that the energy of an object, the force with which it collided with another object, could very simply be accounted for by its mass and its velocity. In correspondence with scientists in Germany, Du Châtelet learned of another view, that of Gottfried Leibniz. He proposed that moving objects had a kind of inner spirit. He called it vis viva, Latin for living force. Many discounted his ideas, but Leibniz was convinced that the energy of an object was made up of its mass times its speed squared. 
taking the square of something is an ancient procedure. If you say a garden is four square, you mean that it might be built up by four slabs along one edge and four along the other. So the total number of paving slabs is four times four, 16. If the garden is eight square, eight by eight, well, eight squared is 64. It'll have 64 slabs in it. This huge multiplication, this building up by squares, is something you find in nature all the time. Emily, 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 you are being absurd. Why ascribe to an object a vague and immeasurable force like this viva? It is a return to the old ways. It is the occult! When movement commences, you say it is true that a force is produced which did not exist until now. Think of our bodies. To have free will, we must be free to initiate motion. So all Leibniz is asking is where does all this force come from? In your case, my dear, the force, I am sure, is primeval. Oh, you're infuriating! You hide behind wit and sarcasm. You only think you understand Newton. You're incapable of understanding Leibniz. You're provocateur! Everything you do is about something else and makes trouble for you. Criticize this, denounce that. Are you capable of discovering something of your own? I discovered you! Despite the overwhelming support for Newton, Du Châtelet did not waver in her belief. Eventually, she came across an experiment performed by a Dutch scientist, Willem Sagravson, that would prove her point. Sagravson in Leiden has been dropping lead balls into a pan of clay. Dropping lead balls into clay? How very imaginative. <laughs> Using Newton's formulas, Monsieur Voltaire, he then drops a second ball from a higher height, calculated to exactly double the speed of the first ball on impact. So, monsieur, care for a little wager? Newton tells us that by doubling the speed of the ball, we will double the distance it travels into the clay. Leibniz asks us to square that speed. If he is correct, the ball will travel not two, but four times as far. So, who is correct? Monsieur, I feel Mr. Newton's reputation dwindling. Ever so slightly. Oh, mon père, tweed and not succumb to her. There is no earthly reason to ascribe hidden forces to this Dutchman's lead balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ball travels four times further. Turns out, Leibniz is the one who is right. It's the best way to express the energy of a moving object. If you drive a car at 20 miles an hour, takes a certain distance to stop if you slam on the brakes. If you're going three times as fast, you're going 60 miles an hour, it won't take you three times as long to stop. It'll take you nine times as long to stop. <laughs>